In this video, we're going to continue on with the multiprocessing module, and specifically, we're going to be looking at locks, or synonymously mutexes, and we're going to be seeing why these types of objects in the multiprocessing library might be useful to you for code that you'll be writing, making use of multiprocessing. So just very succinctly, a lock or mutex is a synchronization mechanism for enforcing limits on access to a resource in an environment where there are many threads of execution. So that's the first sentence from the Wikipedia article that I've linked here below in the comment section. So if you want to read up more on locks and how they are used in the context of computer science, go ahead and check that link out. This is gonna be more about how to make use of locks in the multiprocessing module. So we're going to start off with just kind of a simple, somewhat contrived example where we're going to start off with a value and we're going to have two functions. One function is going to add a number to this, to this value and another is just going to subtract some set number from this value. So I'm just going to go ahead and start off by writing the main. I'm going to say if underscore underscore name is equal equal to underscore underscore main. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a variable which I'm going to just call total and I'm going to set that equal to initially 500 and I'm going to print this out just so we can verify that total is indeed 500 and then I'm going to say total is equal to a function that we've yet to write which is just called add 500 no MP for no multiprocessing and then we're going to pass in the total variable so generally we're going to set this variable equal to a set value of 500 we're going to print it out and then we're going to pass that value into this function which all it will do is we'll just add 500 to the value that we give it and it's going to do it in such a way where it takes a little bit of a delay in between each integer that is added to this value and as we write the function you'll kind of see what that means and we're going to do another one which is going to be almost the same thing so after we call that function we're going to print it out to verify that we should get a thousand after this uh, after this call and then we're going to do a similar thing where we say total is equal to sub 500 no mp and then we'll give it total so generally the way that we're working up here is we're going to see this example with no multiprocessing whatsoever. And then we're going to see it with multiprocessing and sort of this problem arises where there's a sort of a conflict of access to a shared variable. And then we're going to see how we can use locks to mitigate that risk. Okay, so let's just go ahead and fill in these somewhat contrived functions. In order to do that, I'm just going to make sure that I import a, a time module so we can add this delay. And then I'm going to say from multiprocessing imports uh, process because we'll eventually be using that to create processes not not just yet but we will eventually lock again we'll eventually be using that and value we'll eventually be using that to create a shared value uh, that will be used but at this point we're not going to use that just yet so let's go ahead and create these functions so add 500 no mp no multiprocessing it's going to take a variable and then all it's going to do is it's just going to add one integer at a time for a given delay so let's say for uh, I through 1 to 100, what it's going to do is it's going to say time.sleep for every I of, a, of let's say 0 0.01 and then in this loop we're just going to go ahead and say total plus equal 5 and then we're going to return the total. So all that's really happening here is we're looping through the numbers from 0 to 99, we're adding in a very small sleep uh, and then right before that or right after that rather we're adding 5 to the total we do that 100 times, it's going to add 500 to our number, and then we're just going to return it. And then we're going to have a very similar function, which is going to do almost the exact same thing, only instead of adding, it's just going to subtract. So I'm just going to change the name from add to sub, and I'm going to change this plus to a minus, and it's pretty much all we need. So just, this is somewhat contrived, but hopefully it's going to build up to a scenario that might be a little bit more uh, general and applicable and hopefully illustrate why locks are important. At this point, it's not really clear what locks have to do with anything, but we'll work there eventually. So let me just write this and let me say clear for the terminal and let's say Python multiprocessing locks. If we run this, what we should expect to see is the output of 500. We're printing out the total. Then we add 500 to it, so we should see 1,000 as we're printing that out. And actually, before I run it, I'm just going to print out the total again after we do the subtraction, and we should get back to 500. So we start off with 500, we add 500 to that, subtract 500 from that, go back to our original value. So let's just see that that's actually what we get. So we get 500, 1,000, and then 500 again. So that is pretty simple. Nothing too complicated going on there. So, now, so let's go ahead and change that from the way it's defined here into a way in which doesn't use locks but does make use of the shared value that we're importing here. So we're importing this this uh, object or this class rather value which we're going to create an object of 
and we're going to say that total is now not equal to 500, but we're going to say that it's equal to a shared resource value of the multiprocessing library. The value takes two arguments, one for the data type and one for the data itself. So i is to denote it as an integer, 500 is to denote it as the value 500. And I'm just gonna go ahead and just remove these things for now. Uh, what we're going to do instead of actually modifying the total, so here what we have here is we set, we reset the total variable equal to what is returned from each of these functions. Now what I want to do is I want to make use of this variable here as a shared resource. Each of these functions will manipulate the shared resource and then we'll create processes for each of those functions. We'll run them and then we'll join them and then we'll see what we get at the end. So I'm just going to go back to removing these here. I just wanted to bring those back to explain. So what we're going to do is we're going to rename these now to, instead of no MP, we're just going to call them no lock. So it's making use of the shared variable, but it's not making use of any locks as of yet. The general idea is going to be pretty much the same. We're going to loop through the numbers from 0 to 99. We're going to add a bit of a time delay. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to say total dot value. So since we're passing in now a value object, the way that we access and uh, modify the value itself of this object is we use the dot value method. So what we're doing now is we're just adding five, just like we did before, only using this dot value method. And then instead of returning, we're going to be actually manipulating and modifying the shared resource. So I'm going to get rid of the return statements. Okay, so we've got the change in the name there. We're going to make sure that we do the dot value method for the sub one as well and get rid of the return statement. So we've created our shared variable total. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create two processes. So we'll say add process. We'll set this equal to a process object. We'll create a process object from the process class that we're importing from multiprocessing. And then the target will be the add function. So we'll say target is equal to add 500 uh, no lock. And then we need to pass in the arguments that we're going to be passing to this function as well as a tuple, which in this case is just the shared variable uh, total. So we'll copy that, modify this a little bit to uh, apply to the subtraction process. So sub process, I just want to make sure I spell process correctly, process has an O. Uh, so sub process, and then this is also sub here. And then we've got the same arguments going in there. So now that we've created our two process objects, one for add, one for subtract, we're going to go ahead and start the processes up. So we're going to say add process.start, and then we'll do the same thing with the subtraction as well. So we'll say sub process.start as well. And then just to make sure that before we run anything after these processes, that these processes have indeed completed, we'll say add process.join, process.join. And then we'll also do the same thing for the sub process. So sub process dot join as well. And then once these process processes have actually run and the join has been applied, we'll go ahead and print out the total dot value. So we can actually see what we get here. So let's go ahead and write this. I'll clear the terminal so we don't have any excess output. And let's run this again. So let's see. It looks like I'm passing in something uh, that's not quite good here. Let's see. And I think I see it here. It's because I forgot to put an equal sign after args. So args is equal to this tuple. And that was what I should have been doing. Right, so now we've got our 500. That looks fine now, but let's try it again. So we get 505 this time, which is interesting. Let's try and run it again. If we get 520 this time, let's try and run it again. And we get 500. So it's kind of odd that every time we run this, we're going to get different values, where when you look at this code, you should have the same behavior as we saw last time, where essentially you have this process, an add process that's being started. It's manipulating the shared variable as you would think. And then after that is started, it goes to the subtraction process, subtracts the 500. And then at the end, it should have the value 500 just like we saw from our initial pass at this. However, since we have kind of a delay between each of these uh, in the for loop, this is kind of, I know this is somewhat contrived because you would probably never want to have functions that perform exactly this type of behavior, but you may have two functions that are doing something that you actually care about and there's some time that it takes to complete these these operations. And what's happening here is that the subtraction process might be operating on the shared variable before the add process or vice versa. So you're getting kind of these competing calls to these functions that are accessing resources out of step, where we really want to make sure that the add happens first. We add 500 to the initial variable, the value of 500, we get 1000. And then we subtract it from there. And then we go back to 500. We don't want to have any 
calls that are kind of in between. And this is exactly what's happening here. And this is the motivation for locks. You can imagine a, a problem here if you had, let's say these functions were withdrawal and deposit for some banking application. If you had some withdrawal operation that was to happen and it's in deposit and you were to get different values depending on when you actually run this thing, that wouldn't be a very reliable banking application. You would get different uh, outputs for the balances of customers and you might have some really happy or very sad clients as a result. So. What we're going to do now is we're going to modify this example such that it makes use of a lock and we'll see that it actually solves this problem where it doesn't uh, perform the subtraction prior to actually finishing the, the addition. So what we're going to do here is we're going to define a lock object. So I'll say lock is equal to lock, uppercase, and that's what we imported up here from multiprocessing. And then I'm going to go ahead and pass this into our arguments for our functions. So the first thing I'm going to do just to make this less confusing is I'm just going to say, uh, I'm going to get rid of the no in the function because now we have a lock. I'm going to modify the prototype to now take a lock object for both of these functions. So these will both take a lock. Likewise, I'll have to make sure that I pass in a lock here. So a lock will be passed in, uh, again, the same lock that we created over here. And then we'll start the processes, we'll join them. Uh, but before we do that, before we run the code, we're going to actually make use of the locks within the functions. So what we're going to do before we add to the value is we're going to say lock.acquire. And then after we add it, we're going to say lock release. And so what this basically does is it puts a lock on the process so that way before anything else happens it does this operation here and then once that's completed it releases the lock and it allows the process to complete. So we're going to do the same thing so it's kind of putting a lock on uh, this addition process to make sure that all of the additions in this case are performed prior to all of these subtractions. So we're, we're basically just putting locks around the actual operation that we care about here to make sure that these operations are performed uh, sequentially the way that we that we want them to be performed so we'll do a same the same thing over here for subtraction lock dot release and then all we need to do is let's just uh, write this and let's clear the terminal and I'm going to actually change the name of these functions in the target because it doesn't know what this is now go ahead and write that uh, clear the terminal try that again Clear, and then we'll go ahead and say, uh, not that, we'll go ahead and try to run it. So we, we should see 500. So 500 is the, I know, keep in mind, I'm only printing out the value at the end. So let's go ahead and make sure that we still get 500 after running it a second time. So we don't get anything like 520 or 525 or 505 or whatever we saw before. Now that we have these locks in place, it's making sure that the additions, the, the way in which this process here is, is started here, all of these things are completed first, and then all of these things are completed second, and these are completed in sequence because we're making use of this lock object. It's making sure that these um, these things are, are sort of, these resources are not being accessed prior to how we want them to be accessed in this case. So again, just keeping running this, you'll see that it consistently gets 500 and that's kind of what we want. And again, this is a somewhat contrived example, but you could possibly see how this might be more important if this was something like a banking application with withdrawals and deposits. So that's all I really wanted to kind of get over here in locks. Um, that's pretty much it for this video. So if you have any questions on anything I've mentioned in this video, don't hesitate to leave a question in the comment section below. Uh, if you want to look at the code, the code will be available on my GitHub, and I'll provide a link to that in the description uh, as well. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.